That's, that's how tenuous our grasp on truth is. You've heard the saying before that scientists hold, are supposed to hold their hypotheses lightly and be prepared to give them up. Um, Popper's, Popper's uh, take on this, uh, as you can see, is, is consistent um, with, with that view. We can simply provisionally confirm a proposition by showing that it is not yet demonstrated to be false. Or alternatively, we could conclusively refute a proposition by showing that it is in fact false. So according to Popper, you've got two sets of propositions. You've got a set of propositions, or three, three sets of propositions. One proposition says nothing and has no content, and it's not relevant to science because it's not capable of being falsified. Then you've got a set of propositions which have not yet been falsified, and we take that to be close to the truth. And then you've got a third set of propositions which have been falsified and, and are shown to be incorrect. So another interesting thing about and where he differed from the empirical positivists or the logical positivists is that he claims, um, I, I think correctly, uh, use your own experience of, uh, as scientists, computer scientists, to, to judge this. He argued that science doesn't begin with empirical evidence. The empirical positivist says, says that it does, that the process begins with the evidence, right? Um, Popper argued that it didn't, that it doesn't. He argues that it begins with, with, uh, with some sort of problem or perhaps a myth or perhaps imagination uh, or intuition or something like that, and it works on from there. He stresses in particular that there's no unique, best or one way of reaching a hypothesis which is not disproved. There is no one way, there is no best way of, uh, uh, in respect of the scientific method. Uh, and, and in this, uh, others also agree, Einstein and, and others um, argued, uh, argued a similar point. Now, there would seem to be a problem with Popper's um, propositions so far. And, and I think you can see that there's at least one problem here, uh, and, and that is that it's all very well to be able to demonstrate a proper, that a proposition is false. But how does that help us know what is true? Uh, I mean, are we going to go through every proposition uh, through a process of elimination until we get to something? I mean, it's, it's surely that's not a, practical, uh, not a practical method. Popper argued that um, we can get closer to the truth. Um, the, and the way that we can get closer to the truth is in a process uh, that is rather like uh, natural selection in biological evolution. What, what you have here is a problem situation, say problem situation one, and a number of tentative theories, tentative theory one, that is subject um, to to a systematic and rigorous attempt at elimination, at, at falsification. If it survives, it survives as PS2. And so you can see here that through subjecting propositions to this rigorous process of elimination, the fittest will survive. Now, note, note here... Popper is not arguing for truth here. He's not saying that the true ones will survive. He's simply saying that the best will survive, that the fittest will survive. Now, what he means by that is he means propositions that are more truth-like than their competitors, propositions that are more truth-like, not necessarily true. Um, so, Popper, through, through this process over a couple of decades, um, uh, Popper severely damaged the, um, the logical positivists. Um, I'll go on now and critique Popper, and you'll see how he was severely damaged as well. 
Um, but before I do so, let me point out that he still remains a very important and, and a powerful figure in a, in a sense, um, particularly at, uh, in the United States over the last uh, 10 years or so, where <clears throat> it has become politically important to define what science is and what science is not. The reason that it's politically important is that according to the uh, American Constitution, uh, public schools must teach science in science classes, not non-science, and in particular not religion. You will know that there are a group of fundamentalist Christians who argue for a thing called creation science or intelligent design, it's, it's sometimes called. And they have argued, and sometimes successfully in some jurisdictions, in some states and in some schools, that intelligent design or creation science is in fact a science, that it is part of the family of Western modern science, and therefore it can and should be taught alongside evolution, alongside Darwinian science and evolutionary science in American classrooms. A key evidentiary point in making the argument about evolutionary science and intelligent design has been that it is, they are not falsifiable. The historians of science who've been called to, to give evidence have gone back to Popper and resurrected Popper, if you like, uh, and, and rehabilitated uh, Popper and used Popper's falsifiability uh, to argue uh, a definition of science. Um, what did Popper have to say about what is true then? If, uh, if it's important to demonstrate what is false, how can we show what is true? Popper uses the term verisimilitude instead of truth. And as I say, this English word verisimilitude means approximating truth, getting close to truth, being more truth-like without necessarily being true. He argued that some propositions had greater verisimilitude than others, even though they may well not be true. So Newton's theory of motion, for example, is not true in the sense that there are aspects of Newton's theory of motion which are false. Taken as a package, Newton's theory of motion is not true. However, Newton's theory of motion has more verisimilitude than Aristotle's theory of motion. It is able, Newton's theory of motion is able to explain more. It is able to predict more. It is able to do so with greater accuracy, both past data and future data. So whilst Newton's theories Newton's theories of motions may not be entirely true, they are truer than Aristotle's theories and they are to be preferred for that reason. And so Popper argued we, uh, we can uh, approach, approach the truth. Popper proposed that we live in three worlds as scientists the three worlds that are accessible to science and the three worlds, <coughs> he argued, <coughs> that govern science are firstly the physical world. Okay, so whilst he disagrees with the power of induction, he has no disagreement with empiricism as such. He is an empiricist. He does argue that we need to observe the world in a systematic way. He does argue that we should use induction and deduction whilst being aware of the shortcomings of induction and deduction. So the physical world, the world of atoms and chemicals and crystals and stars is a world that the scientist must engage with. The, the second world is the world inside our own heads, the world of our own theories and our own imagination and our own experience and, and our own senses, all of, all of that cognitive, cognitive and emotional 
activity that goes, goes on uh, inside the mind is also important to the scientist, according to Popper. The third, and, and by the way, the empirical positivists wouldn't go quite so far as that. The third world, the empirical positivists would reject. Popper's third world is the world of knowledge. He argues that books are important, that universities are important, that talking and arguing with other people are important, that the way we share knowledge, that the social nature of knowledge is important, the cultural passing on of knowledge um, is important. Again, the empiricists would disagree with this, but Popper proposed it anyway. And it becomes important. You'll see when we go on to discuss scientific realism and then the sociology of scientific knowledge, you'll see that this, this argument that the social world, the world of universities and books and conferences and, so, and what have you, that this what role the social world plays is extremely controversial. Now... Popper, so Popper, uh, um, Popper made a significant contribution, uh, as, as I hope uh, I've been able to outline. However, um, there wouldn't, whilst scientists today would go along with falsifiability, many of them would go along with Popper's three worlds, uh, there's probably not a lot of card carrying. Popperians, as, as we say. There, there, there wouldn't be a lot of people who would, uh, you know, die in the ditch defending um, Popper's ideas. Pr Practising scientists, that is, I, I, I'm, I'm talking about. And, and one reason for this is that the, the common sense one that's a, that no doubt has occurred to you as I've been speaking, in your work, you want to know what's true, don't you? You want to know what's true. You don't want to know what's false. You want to know what's true. So Popper's very idea of falsifiability, whilst it makes sense in terms of formal logic, whilst it makes sense in terms of providing an ultimate proof, it doesn't make a lot of sense in explaining the day-to-day -day work of common a garden scientists working away in their laboratories, working away... You know, at, at their microscopes and at their computers, etc. Scientists want to know what's true, not what's false. And maybe even that's an exaggeration. Maybe they don't want to even know what's true. Maybe they just want to know what's most likely to be true. What's most likely to be true. Not what is irrefutably proven to be true. And you'll see in your own work and you'll see in the work of practising scientists all, all over the place that if, if something is most likely to be true, regardless of whether it can be irrefutably proved to be true, it is, pr it is preferred over something uh, which, which is less likely to be true. So th this notion of likelihood, of, of approximating truth, coming close to truth, um, is, is important. And again, th this will come up uh, again uh, when I discuss the scientific, realis the scientific realists. Um, another problem with um, Popper is that um, logical testability uh, not transferring into practical testability. Um, scientists, working scientists, need to do things in a pragmatic way. They have a limited amount of money, they have a limited amount of data, etc., etc. Um, they, they, their empirical work is therefore limited and scientists need to accept that and just get on with the job. And it's all very well for Popper to say, well, you haven't irrefutably demonstrated the proof of the truth of this proposition. That, that may well be so. But not very many scientists lose sleep over that. They're just getting as close to the truth as they possibly can. A third or fourth uh, problem with Popper is the problem of just exactly what is being falsified 
when a proposition is empirically falsified, just just what it, what is being uh, falsified here. Um, 